Thank you so much for allowing me to take part in this, for having invited me. I do hope that half an hour will be enough uh, to allow me to address the need to no longer be allowed to uh, grow. Florian has already touched on it. Of course, this is about the question of how capitalism can be reshaped, redesigned. Is that even possible? Can the growth element be taken out? First of all, we have to understand the problem at hand, though. And to be able to do that, I think you have to start by talking about capitalism in general, because a lot of people have very different views of what capitalism is all about. And together, we should then agree, be able to agree on a definition. So to achieve that, why don't I set out for you how I view the system and how I believe that it came about? So brief what everyone is thinking about is why climate protection happens to be so challenging. That's also the question raised by the young people in Fridays for Future uh, events. First of all, I believe you have to understand capitalism. You have to grasp what it is at its core. The important thing about capitalism is that it was the first social system in human history that created growth. Now, prior to that, and we do not remember that, globally there has not ever been a per capita growth, whether it was uh, the Romans 2,000 years ago or the Chinese uh, Empire, which was quite far developed, never has there been per capita growth. It was stagnating agricultural societies that were around at the time. Most people lived and worked in rural areas. And let me just give you one figure that illustrates just how different life is today. The average life expectation at the time was 30 to 35 years. In other words, had I been born 200 years ago, the probability, or say 250 years ago, the probability of uh, me having reached the age of 57 and being able to speak to you would have been none. So you have to understand that capitalism is a miracle in a way in that it creates permanent growth. What may also be important to be aware of is how long this system has been around. Modern capitalism came about in about 1760 in England. That's what you read in uh, the school textbooks. That's when industrialization started. And it started with um, textile manufacturers who suddenly um, came up with um, looms and uh, mechanization of their systems. Uh, labor is replaced by machines, originally us using water power and then steam generated power. And the question that, that all researchers, economic researchers, are still pondering is why was it England? Why was it 1760? And the best explanation they've come up with so far, and I'll just go through this very briefly, was that in the 18th century, salaries in England happened to be the highest in the world. Real wages uh, were twice as high than they were on the European continent. Now, why that was the case, I won't explain. but. The crucial part is because human labor was so expensive, the British were no longer competitive. And in a world where everybody lives in a rural area and where there is no industry around, the only thing that you were able to export uh, at the time was textiles. And these textiles were no longer competitive. Fabric wasn't competitive anymore because human labor was so expensive in England. And at that point in time, for the first time, it became um, worthwhile to turn to machines because clearly machines also have a cost. They're expensive. They're not cheap. But machines will only be worthwhile and pay off if they're not more expensive than human labor itself. And at this point, that is, at the moment where for the first time machines are being used, where equipment is being used, an individual laborer can create more output and that brings growth into the world. And what we can learn from this story, and that is the reason why I'm sharing this in such detail, is that no one really 
planned for capitalism. Capitalism came about by way of a coincidence because salaries happened to be high in England and because a number of uh, fabric manufacturers wanted to run a profitable operation once again. But it was due to this use of equipment and technology that growth came about. And there you see a very close link, which is both central and fatal. Capitalism equals growth. Growth is the use of technology. Technology means the use of fossil fuels. Otherwise, the technology wouldn't be up and running. Equipment couldn't be used. And unfortunately, fossil fuels uh, result in the emission of greenhouse gases. So to just summarize that once again, Capital in capitalism consists in the form of equipment. And uh, at the heart of capitalism, you have the very investments in this technology, in this equipment. And these investments uh, are not just snatched from uh, thin air. They are driven by the fact that salaries are high. It is high salaries that drive capitalism rather than low salaries and wages. Now, what you may have gleaned from everything that I've said so far is that clearly I'm not a critic of capitalism. I'm just enthusiastic about this system because, as I said, it's the first system in human history that has brought about prosperity. We're 20 times as uh, rich than our ancestors in the 18th century were. So. There you have it, capitalism in a nutshell. However, and this will not be news to you, there is a glitch. There is a problem here. It's a wonderful system. However, it's doomed to fail for in a finite world, you cannot have infinite growth. That's not possible. There are clear limits, two clear limits that everyone is aware of. There is and limit of an environmental nature, and there's a limit in terms of uh, resources. And these limits have long been reached. Currently, at this point in time in Europe, we're using up three planets worth. All we have is a single Earth, though. So the question that everyone is pondering currently is, now what? And you, ha you so you have this really nice system a nifty system that helped free industrialized nations from poverty, but it in no way can be allowed to continue. So there are a number of ways, um, ideas that people have come up with that are being discussed, and I can't go into all of them, unfortunately, in my 30 minutes. And of course, I can invite you to ask questions afterwards. But let me touch on a number. The first idea, which you'll be aware of, is to just forego the growth such that you reduce your own level of consumption. Now, for Germans at least, that wouldn't be a problem. There's a very good study by the uh, German Federal Office for the Environment, which is very intelligent and consists of two parts. In part one, people were asked, this was a representative survey of households, how many objects they own, and um, every single fork had to be counted. And it turned out that, on average, people own about 10,000 objects. The second part of the study, that's the intelligent part, was that people were asked just how many of these objects, in fact, they happen to be touching regularly. And it turned out that it was only 5,000 of these objects that they actually put their hands on. So half of the entire household was filed away in whatever cupboards, attics, basements. Everyone will be aware that in their own household, they have things that they never even look at. So, But if that is true, that in fact you don't even need 50% of the objects you own, then you could just say, well, let's just reduce our consumption to 50%, to half of things. But that's a complete misunderstanding of how capitalism works. For cynically enough, what we have now is a situation in the West is that we don't consume in order to satisfy our needs. We consume in order to stabilize the system. Or to put it the other way around, capitalism would instantly collapse if we, as the consumers, were to go on strike and switch off growth. And 
the fact that this is the case, that apparently it's of crucial importance to uh, stabilize incomes and to see to it that income is being spent is something that we're see being seeing illustrated very clearly as part of the COVID pandemic. In, in, it's an involuntary crisis, involuntarily foregoing to consume things, and it hasn't even taken two weeks for the German government to intervene in order to prevent the entire system from collapsing. 400 billion euro so far have been injected by the German government into the economy, but the um, 1.4 billion euro are now or trillion euro are um, expected or possible because everybody knows just how dangerous it would be if the economy were to collapse from one day to the next. So picture if you were to forego consumption, less consumption means fewer jobs. That in turn means less consumption because those who are unemployed can no longer indulge in consumption. And all of a sudden, uh, you can't even uh, see it happen as quickly as it would happen. You'd be in a spiral that would be bottomless, a chaotic shrinkage would ensue. So that's what you have to be aware of. Capitalism is not something that is static. It's not a solid state. Indeed, it is remarkable. Capitalism is something that is either growing or shrinking. It's a dynamic system. Or to put it the other way around, there is no such thing as income that can simply be distributed. Income is something that is being formed uh, as part of the process of capitalist production. And as soon as you interfere with that production process, for instance, by means of consumers going on strike or something else, such as the COVID pandemic, this uh, in interferes. And we're all sort of caught in, in this hamster wheel. Plus, there's history to think about Hitler can be mentioned. It's really risky when there's an economic crisis, when there's unemployment that's rising, because then people lose their outlook. They're afraid, uh, frightened. Uh, they panic. And if the crisis doesn't go away very quickly, you'll see right-wing radicalists crop up and dictators. So if you want to get away from capitalism, what you have to do is you have to find a way of not producing a severe economic crisis, because that would put an end to democracy without you having done anything to benefit the environment. And because it is so hard to leave growth behind, the second idea is also very popular that also everyone is familiar with. Let's go for green growth then. Now, this is the idea that somehow green growth is what you'd like to have. That's something that the Political parties are pursuing now. Not only the Green Party, uh, central right parties too are pursuing that idea. And the idea at its core really is, as you know, everything will stay as it was, but you'll be driving an electric car rather than a car with a combustion engine that requires diesel or um, fuel. But everything else will pretty much stay as it was, and things would continue as you're used to them. Now, wouldn't that be a dream? I would. Love it if, in fact, there could be such a thing as green growth. But from my point of view, that is an illusion that will never, ever become reality. For the problem with green growth, of course, is that somehow you'd have to manage to make it happen that the fossil fuels that currently is pow are powering capitalism would be turned into green energy. However, taking a closer look at it, you realize that the only thing that can be produced in an ecological fashion is electricity, either wind power or solar energy. Anything else will be fossil, fossil fuels. And then you find that if eco-electricity, green electricity is what you need, then you will find that it will always remain a scarce resource. Now, that may seem remarkable at first that eco-energy is supposedly sparse because after all the sun is shining consistently and continuously, and it's true, the sun is sending incredible amounts of energy towards the Earth. The sun produces about 10,000 times as much energy as all people on the Earth would need in order to live as we live in the West. So what we do not have is a lack of physical energy. The problem is, and everybody's aware of that, this kind of energy needs to be captured solar panels or wind installations. 
and that is where it becomes tricky. One's got to be aware, and often this is left out or uh, buried in the statistics, if you want a climate neutral economy and industry, then all industries, and I mean all of them, would have to be changed over to eco-power. So not just electricity, it's not just uh, abandoning fossil f uh, fuels and energies to green energy, but it would be, have to be the entire transport, heating, energy system, all of that would have to be eco-powered. And that's a challenge that is illustrated by the fact that wind energy at the moment makes up about 5.4% of overall energy consumption in Germany. And solar is even less. So, more than 90% of our economy and industry would still have to be switched over to ecological ele electricity and power. And that illustrates what kind of channel challenge it is. And the challenge mostly lies in the fact, and that's again something everybody is aware of, that the wind is not there all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time. So one necessarily will have to store eco-energy so that it is available when needed. At the moment, and this is what distorts perception of eco-power, we are generating and storing wind and sun under optimum conditions. Firstly, we only replace fossil-powered uh, energy by ecologically generated energy, so it's still the same type of energy. And then there's priority to eco-power. So when there is wind, it gets fed into the grid. If the sun shines, it gets fed into the grid. But if there is no wind at the moment, then fossil energy takes over. That is no longer possible if you want to be truly climate neutral and if you change over all industries to be powered by eco-power, then you've got to store it. And that is difficult. One option is batteries, the other option is to use hydrogen as an interim storage facility. But you're probably aware of that too, the hydrogen technology would need for that in order to capture and store and make available eco-power around the clock hasn't even been developed yet. In our COVID package, there's seven billion provided by the national government for hydrogen research. That's right, and I don't want to criticize that. But that goes to show that when we talk hydrogen, we're still at the very beginning. And even if we had the hydrogen technology, all of that is very difficult indeed and also requires a lot of energy input. So. What I am not trying to say at all, you can probably imagine that, is that we don't need to do climate protection. That is absolutely necessary and indispensable. We can't continue to heat up the earth. But one's got to be aware, with everything we know, eco-power will remain a scarce resource. So, once we realize that energy is a scarce resource and limited, then the only consequence can be that the economy has got to shrink, not grow. There's no green growth, there's got to be green shrinking. And to also do away with another common misunderstanding, this is not the return to the Stone Age. That's often a fear people then voice. They hear, oh, no growth but shrinking, then uh, the next day it's back to the cave. No, it's not the end of civilization or return to Stone Age which uh, can also be explained by our living conditions. I mean, I don't know, I can't see you right now, but I don't know how many of you were around in 1975. But those who were there will remember in 1975, we also had a good standard of living. It was pretty much like now, except that there weren't strawberries in winter and one wouldn't go on a two-day trip to Majorca. But if you went at all, you took a three-week car trip to Italy, which is probably better. And obviously, there weren't any smartphones. But actually, and everybody who was alive back then in 1975 were just as happy as today. So the state of happiness and of satisfaction hasn't changed at all. However, by now, the German industry and economy produces 150% more than in 1975. So economic output has doubled, happiness has remained equal. So that goes to illustrate that economic growth doesn't mean more satisfaction. Reversely, one could say we could easily produce less and still be happy. 
So, that's not really the point then. Then one's got to think, okay, looking at eco-energy, what is it likely to be sufficient for and what not? And one can be pretty certain that a climate-neutral industry rules out flying in whichever way, domestic flights certainly, but also intercontinental flights. That's not to be. That's a thought everybody would need to get used to by and by. Also, eco-energy will also not be sufficient to power privately owned cars, also not electric vehicles, because the e-electronic vehicle or electric vehicle is not harmless. It uses up a lot of uh, resources and a lot of energy. Now, obviously, at airports, there are jobs. People work at airports, people work in the automotive industry in Germany, a total of 1.75 million in total, directly and indirectly. And then going on to think what else would become superfluous in a shrinking world, in a shrinking economy. What one wouldn't need at all anymore would be banks, maybe the small savings banks. But the large banking business lend, get, giving out loans in order to finance growth, that would be obsolete if you actually shrink. Also insurances, life insurances particularly, have no place in the world anymore because life insurances also are built on the growth principle. You pay in your premiums and at the end you get out more than you paid in. That too won't work in a shrinking world. You don't need PR agencies anymore, um, trade show logistics and the whole lot. So you can see a shrinking economy is an entirely different story from what we have today. And millions of people would need a new job. So a shrinking eco-economy, however, would not be the end of work, because new jobs would be created. For example, in ecological farming, which is a lot more labor-intensive than industrialized farming, or also in the forests, because that's easy to foresee. Climate change, as we have it already, as we can no longer stop it, the German forest, in its current form will not survive. And then one's got to think of what to do then. And again, that will require a lot of people, a lot of manual labor. So it's not the point that there will be no more work. Be, there will be a lot of work around, but we will no longer have the same income as we have today, because obviously in a shrinking economy, you can't consume as much as today. As I said, it's not a return to the Stone Age but it's shrinking. And that brings up another central problem, though. To illustrate it a bit more, over here, that's the dynamically growing capitalism, and the objective is a cyclic economy, where you only consume what you can recycle and where you only produce what you actually can produce with climate-neutral energy. But what's lacking in the discussion so far, and entirely lacking, is the process to get there, the bridge, the transformation. So how to organize this kind of shrinking, how to get out of dynamic capitalism towards this recycling or cyclic economy without there being a massive economic crisis on the way, which would only have the effect of some right-wing dictator coming to power. I mean, we've been there. So that's a largely unsolved problem. However, there is one model in history from which you can see how a capitalist economy was shrunk. And I'm explicitly saying is it is just an analogy. I'm not here to say that this is the way we ought to do it, 100% identical. But just to, as some food for thought, maybe, how government-oriented shrinking could look like. And this model for shrinking is the British war economy, of all things, starting in 1939. Back then, the problem was that the British hadn't seen World War II coming. They believed, and we all know that from our history books, that Hitler could be contained in some way with the famous appeasement policy. 
one would have given him Austria, one would have given him um, the, some parts in the East, and that it all didn't work out. The Brits only realized in March 1939 when Hitler was invading Prague. They hadn't seen that coming. The idea was to end up with some kind of Czechoslovak rump state. And then he was in Prague and everybody realized, okay, this is the beginning of the Second World War, which indeed broke out in 1939 with Hitler's invasion of Poland. Now, the problem to the British was not only that this was the beginning of a new world war, but also strategically it was clear that Hitler could only win this Second World War if he was to conquer Great Britain. The British were aware of that, and Hitler was aware of that. That's what, what he told his generals, from which you can see, but that is just an aside, that Hitler had already strategically planned and lost the Second World War in summer 1940, when he did not succeed in conquering Britain. All the remainder was murder and suicide. But okay, that was an aside. The British knew, right, Hitler is attacking us and we haven't prepared. And now, in a very short period of time, they had to uh, reduce their peace economy, and this is my analogy now, in order to free capacities for unnecessary products such as tanks and submarines, which you don't need at all in normal life. And in a way, there was something that had to happen over weeks. And during that period, the British invented two things which I believe would be helpful up until today and also looking ahead into the future. One is they invented these statistical methods to even measure what is produced in a national economy. Nobody was aware of that before. So back then, the uh, or that is when the uh, principles of national economics were created that we still use today. And second thing, the British came up with a kind of private planned economy. It was something entirely different from what uh, happened at the same time under Stalin and the Soviet Union. Everybody knows what happened there, Soviet-style, socialist-planned economy. Everybody, everything being nationalized and everything planned through until the last uh, bolt and screw. That's not what happened in Great Britain. Nothing was nationalized there. Shops, restaurants, companies remained privately owned, but the state dictated what was to be produced in this economy, and it was also in charge of distribution. Rationing is the word here. So the Brit British in the Second World War didn't starve, they weren't suffering from hunger, hunger, but it was rationed. And the objective was for things to be fair, everybody was to get the same. And that, by the way, was quite popular in Great Britain, which is why rationing actually was kept in place until 1954. In Germany, they were always thinking, oh, the poor British, they must have been so hungry and starving that they had rationing until 1954. No, that wasn't the case. But rather, it was discovered and appreciated as an instrument of ensuring fairness when goods become scarce. Things such as sugar, milk, meat, and so on were rationed. And this kind of private planned economy with rationing is what I believe we will also have a need in the future. The only question is whether we decide to do so early on to stop or to slow down climate change or whether we'll be forced to do it once climate change has progressed so far that we will have to do it. And I'm coming to the end now, my final word on this. This might still sound extremely abstract. Okay, the national government is to ration and to plan, but I think we will quite automatically enter into such a kind of system, given the coercions and restrictions due to climate change. The first thing in this context will be water. Right now, Germany, or say Germany generally, will not become a desert because of climate change, but rain will become less, generally speaking, and it won't rain as regularly as in the past. So much more frequently we'll be seeing what we saw in summer 2018. For months, no rain at all. And then that is where distribution conflicts arise. Question being of who will get the water, the households, the industry, or agriculture and farming. And then everybody, we know that, are immediately knocking at the door of the government saying, now you government have to regulate who receives what kind of and how much water. And that immediately is rationing. I mean, 
absolutely immediately you then come up with a new regime. And this kind of uh, government management will then continuously increase. And that, I believe, is the one thing we can learn and uh, take along from the COVID crisis as an experience to be translated into climate protection. We're all realizing now how strong the government is, how ready and willing to act, and how intensely national government and industry and economy can work together. And that, to me, would be the model for the future. And with that, I'm done and look forward to the discussion. But first of all, thank you for allowing me to speak here.